Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. He has not been on this show for a very, very long time. Now, that's partly my fault. That's partly his fault. But I'm going to say it's my fault because, you know, he is a very busy person. And I have not scheduled him in a very, very long time. The last time we had him on was when we were talking about the tales of mystery but we're going to talk about wrestling comics butts and seats horror and the master of all things horror i cannot i have to always say that title for you because you are truly the master of all things horror the ever talented dirk manning how are you doing today dirk very good it's good to see you my friend i've been thinking about this all week about how long it's been since we've last <laughs> spoken um on the air like this yeah. and it's been a while man so it's, it's good to see you it's good yeah. to good to be back as well thank you yeah. it, it's, but I, we, I, we have you back now we we got a lot to talk about obviously you know we have an hour to do this you're a very busy person i want to talk about first off let's let's start off with this question here we're going to talk about butts and seats in a second but okay. just to lighten the mood what sport would be the funniest to add mandatory amounts of alcohol to See, you're you're getting me on two things I don't know a lot about because I don't drink and I don't watch a lot of sports. Oh, so <laughs> I would say to add copious amounts of alcohol to, mm -hmm. I'm going to go dodgeball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get you know, I, guess I picture me like throwing, you know, stumbling around and stuff. It, it looked like drunken kung fu. I don't know if there's competitive. I'm sure there's competitive dodgeball out there <laughs> somewhere, but. Uh, that also demonstrates my complete lack of anything sports. So. Perfect. And thus, that, that I can just erase this question from air and it'll never see the light of day. That well, was, well, my answer wasn't good enough? Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I'll leave it. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's talk, let's talk, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> wrestling and let's talk writing. Uh, I got to get you laughing at any point in time in this interview. That's why I threw that question out there. But uh, no, man, that's good. That's good. Wrestling is obviously a huge part of, of, culture in terms of sports entertainment in terms of um the creativity when it comes to the writing when it comes to the uh, amazing talented athletes that are truly there as well as the stories that everything gets come up with there how did seats come into play and how did you get attached to it yeah um but since this came about through the work of Mike Dawkins. He was a big part of it. Uh, he's known online in wrestling circles. I was the gimmick attorney. I've known Mike for many, many years. Um, I worked with him very early on in some contract stuff when I was doing an online comic with MTV Geek back in the day. Kind of lost touch, you know, and then ended up reconnecting um, through another mutual friend, Scoot McMahon, who is the uh, co-creator of The Adventures of Cthulhu Jr. and Dastardly Dirk which is coming out in 2022, I promise everyone. I mean, that's been one of the most anticipated books. It was supposed to come out last year, or 2020, but 2020 happened. But anyway, so he connected with Mike, and um, he is also, like I said, friends with a lot of the wrestlers. And he had been talking to Tony Schiavone about, who's a big comic book fan, about, hey, how would, would you be interested in doing a comic book? And so he got to talk to Tony and then his plan was to come talk to me uh, at the last E2E2, E2, which was the last major convention before everything mm -hmm. shut down. I had a, uh, a rather serious uh, family situation. Uh, my, my grandfather had fallen very ill uh, down in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I had to miss C2E2 E2 to fly down to Florida to, to, to be with him and my grandmother um, and help get him back. Little did I know that would be the last convention for 18 months but i think mike's plan because tony was there as well was to connect tony and i when that didn't work he got a hold of me on the side and goes hey how would you feel about doing a comic book with tony shivani you know who's a very legendary wrestling announcer tony would be very loath to uh hear himself described that way but but he is you know he's a he's a legend in the industry mm -hmm. so mike asked me if i'd be interested and my response to him famously was i'd be willing to have that conversation <laughs> You know, I'm a huge wrestling fan. I mean, anybody that knows me knows that, you know, uh, heavy metal, horror, and ice cream are like three of the, the, the along with comics, are like the foundational elements of my fandom. But I was concerned about getting wrapped up in what could have been a vanity project. Hmm. 
you know, I, I have done comics based on other real people. I did a one shot with Harp Twins. Uh, obviously, I continue to work with uh, Twisted on Twisted's Haunted High Ons with Source Point Press. But doing a autobiographical comic, that's that can be tricky, you know. Um, so this was a situation where I decided I would meet with Mike and Tony on Zoom. And if it worked out, we would go from there. And if not, I figured I could maybe hand it off to another writer I knew, maybe help project manage it, facilitate it a little bit. Tony and I hit it off, um, brought in Adrena Joe as editor. Uh, we lined up a all-star cast of artists yeah. and we did the whole book through Zoom for over a year. You know? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was cool because we I ended up bringing in initially ten artists and it grew to about twenty four, twenty five artists wow. on the whole book, which kind of goes back to my old nightmare world days, you know, like bringing in different artists to different stories and things yeah. like that. But we had Zoom meetings every couple of weeks. We would we would talk. We would uh, you know make notes and stuff like that. I would go through, write the scripts, send them to Drina, send them to Tony. They go over them, things like that. We 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 tweak it, send it off to the artist, and get to the next one. But uh, yeah, it's been an amazing process, and especially with AEW now, it's hotter than it's ever been. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and again, to merge my love of wrestling and comics has been a really cool experience. Looking at the amount of uh, wrestling figures and the story of, of Tony's life, especially being in the forefront because this is about him and his wrestling days, what were the ethics in terms of writing this book? Yeah, you know, luckily we had Mike Dawkins on the team who, again, is not a lawyer, but he specializes in uh, trademark and IP. So we were able to very much navigate those waters safely. There were stores that wanted to be like, we could get a, asked if they could get, for example, um, a variant cover of the graphic novel with like them and Tony Schiavone and Wrestler X. And it's like, well, you can't really get Wrestler X because, you know, I mean, that, that that's their, oftentimes their identities are their intellectual property. Uh, but then in regard so in regards to telling the story itself though um this is tony's uh life story you know there there are different characters and different people that are part of that story uh we treat everybody very respectfully this is not a book the it's not dirt sheet <laughs> you know this isn't a situation where anybody gets buried even when we talk about things that you know are some of the more infamous moments of of the wrestling industry that Tony was a part of. This is never a situation where uh, a crossword is really said about anybody. It's Tony's observations about how he saw the industry and what was going on, which includes some very big figures, you know, your Ric Flair's, your Mick Foley's, your Hulk Hogan's, Sting, uh, Eric Bischoff. Um, they're in there, you know, um, but this is just Tony talking about his life, you know, and a book's never a place to grind any axes. Or, uh, or or bury someone because that book's going to be forever and you might eventually make amends with a person, you know. Or, <laughs> not to mention, obviously, as you kind of hinted at, like the ethical and legal aspects of doing something like that. But uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's a story about his life. And, and if people are part of his life, he, he talks about them a little bit, but but the focus remains on, on Tony. You've been a fan of wrestling for a long time. Looking, <clears throat> talking with Tony and, and being now part of the industry in a sense of writing his story. Um, was there anything that surprised you about Tony that maybe you didn't realize about him? He is incredibly, incredibly humble. Uh, he really sees his job as putting other people over. And him and I, personality wise, are a lot alike, you know, I mean, very much so. I've always historically in my my comic career really tried to like use any platform I have to help you know maybe put put people over as well you know um, and some people appreciate it and I guess some don't but you know to me it's always about getting yourself out there and putting yourself over and putting other people over and, and creating a great product and telling a great story uh, and that's all important you know but but Tony's a guy that if you give him compliments he withers man he withers right up you know I, i'm kind of the i i have the same issue but i was kind of like self-deflect and like you know like you know judo it back at somebody you know or throw a street fighter fireball apparently but uh yeah it, it was just one of the reasons that i i really jumped at the opportunity to do the book was because of the fact that this was clearly not going to be a vanity project for him this was something that 
he has a fascinating story going from being a uh, a fan of wrestling to being involved in the industry to leaving the industry to coming back and and, and being part of this new reinvigoration of the industry it, it's it's an incredible story you know and, and tony and i've talked about the fact that he's like i didn't think my story was that interesting but we looking at it in this format and looking at it in this way it became very obvious to him that yeah this is a this is a heck of a tale What's right. a, what surprised you about the wrestling business and how did it affect your writing? I'm kind of like a smark, you know, it's like, I, I know, I think I know a pretty decent amount about the industry. Um, and again, with, with the internet being the way it is and things like that, it becomes very um, easy to think that you know more than you do. The internet does that too. You know, people send out one tweet or, or make one story about something and everyone thinks they know the inside dirt and the scoop. There were, that being said, there were things I learned about um, wrestling culture mm. that I really don't even know if I'd be comfortable talking about here, but very subtle nuances um, that were, were shocking, like in the culture of the etiquette and how you address certain things and how you interact with certain aspects of the industry that, like I said, I thought I knew a lot about it. And I, and I do, I know a, a pretty fair amount about the wrestling industry. You know, I mean, people would ask me all the time, oh, are you ever going to go right for a wrestling show? It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know enough about it to know that I don't need to deal with all those egos. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, I, I, I just some inside stuff was was pretty interesting to learn about. Um, I wouldn't really feel like it's a proper putting it on blast, but yeah. there's definitely layers upon layers of nuance in the culture and there were one one time in particular i'm thinking of where we we're going to depict the scene in a certain way and tony said well we can't do it this way and it was one of the only times he was like really adamant like we absolutely can't do this and i'm like okay i go that you know that's fine well you know i'm just curious as to why so i know for next time he told me i was like oh wow okay you know it's kind of like i guess to, to equate it this way um I, I trained and, and taught martial arts for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my, my, my grandmaster, not one of, he was my grandmaster, was from Korea. And you don't make direct eye contact when talking to him. That's considered, you know, in that teacher student relationship that is very disrespectful. When you walk, you take off your shoes and you bow first thing and, you know, things like that. So even to this day, a lot of times when I'm talking to someone, if I, you know, that I respect or something like that, I. I tend to look down like this. I'm not looking at them this way, you know, and it's a, it's a martial arts thing. Mm -hmm. Things like that, that I found out about the wrestling culture were, were pretty, pretty eye opening. That's interesting. I was going to ask what was the hardest scene to write in your, in butts and seats then? I don't know if there was really a scene that was particularly hard because Tony's such a master storyteller, you know, he, he's, incredibly good you know i mean obviously he has the, the the what happened when podcast and things like that and in his life is telling stories so it was very smooth um we went into the creation of the book knowing we were going to break tony's life in wrestling down to 10 segments uh 10 10 page chapters and there was one or two of them that i really wasn't sure i could get into 10 but like the time when he left wrestling was almost a 20 year gap. Oh, wow. We cover that in 10 pages. We covered the infamous Knights of the Butts and Seats call with Mick Foley in 10 pages. You know, so it's interesting that, you know, like that, that 10 page chapter for each one, you know, when Colm Griffin does the Butts and Seats chapter, I mean, basically we're talking about the events of a night yeah. and the following morning, more or less, in 10 pages. When Josh Ross does the chapter about leaving wrestling, we're talking about almost a two decade span when he's outside of it, so. That was uh, a unique challenge, but pardon me, but um, that was probably the biggest thing. Even that, yeah, he just, he, it was a very seamless process, you know, and, and it was cool to work with so many different artists again. So that, I mean, yeah. there's always certain challenges in working with two dozen artists on a project. Well, um, and that's the, another thing. I saw the list of artists that you have. I mean, DJ Kaufman, a variety of others, though, mm -hmm. in looking at, the artist that you got for this book, which style was your favorite? Not saying which artist was your favorite, but which style was your favorite? Oh, man. Again, you know, I went back to my Nightmare World days about finding the best 
artist to suit each chapter of the story you know it's like scott james did the wcw one scott draws really big exaggerated characters you know and stuff like that so he was he did one of the chapters which focused on a lot of the wcw guys with the hogan sting and things like that yeah. you mentioned dj kaufman working with dj kaufman something i wanted to do for all my career dj was one of the guys i looked up to when i was getting started you know he was a little bit ahead of me and and he was definitely a big inspiration to me in a lot of the stuff he did so to work with him was a high mark and, and dj is amazing professional is professional yeah. you know when dj did the first chapter of the book he had <laughs> he must have had like 20 reference photos and stuff right off the bat he's like here's my folder with all my reference photos i was sharing his references with the other artists you know <laughs> um it was good to jam with josh ross again uh austin mckinley's doing tales of mystery volume five so we snuck a story in here first um uh, oh my gosh you know ani is i mean I, I, I love working with them all in different ways, but if you're going to put me on the spot, you know, again, working with DJ was a highlight because I wanted to work with him forever. Um, Colm Griffin, I've never got to work with. It was really cool to work with him. Mariana Pescosta doing the standard cover. Mariana, you know, Ringo Award nominated artist, um, Haunted High Ons. She's so great. And Sally Scott's fantastic. I'm going to be doing more work with her the next year. I, I, Jan Apple, again, doing some. <laughs> I'm just going to start running through the list. I'm going to forget <laughs> someone look like a jerk. But it was all fun in different ways. But but DJ really impressed me. It was fun to it was fun to work with him. And it's always good to jam with my boy Josh Ross again as well. It was Austin McKinley and Lynn. And... Sorry, man. I'm going to keep going. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to like, have to bring up the list and go through. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just about to do that on, on the Kickstarter page there, just, just so I had it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, with this book, you have to edit things out. What did you edit out of this book? You know, I brought I, one of the things I did is I brought in, you know, Drina Joe, fantastic editor. She edits Broken Gargoyles for Source Point Press. Uh, she had some other stuff that's coming out with Source Point. She had taught at High Ons. So I left a lot of the editing to her. <laughs> <laughs> but because we had the economy of the 10 pages per chapter, really it was just about tightening up a few scenes you know um not my first rodeo about writing short stories obviously mm -hmm. I, I built a lot of my career on that again to keep bringing it up we're going back to like nightmare world you know i mean that's and even the first volume of tales of mystery that was kind of my jam so there wasn't a lot you know the only thing is after the whole book was done and things like that tony and i were doing a podcast together and he talked about the story that got him involved in wanting to be a sports announcer. Mm. And he's telling this story and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm listening to it, but I'm literally doing this, like, I'm like, how did, we talked for a year. How did this story never come up? It's incredible. I would have put that at the beginning of the book, you know? So I guess the only thing we got edited out was something that never came up because it really starts with Tony as a teenager watching wrestling with his uncle John and then up to his time in AEW. So I guess that was an inadvertent edit, like this very sentimental, fantastic story. We've joked around that if we ever do an uh, expanded deluxe version or something, I would want to put that in. But that was that was about it. Other than that, it was pretty pretty straightforward. I mean, there was never anything that we um, had to take out because we were burying anybody or anything like that. Yeah, right. So it was pretty pretty seamless, pretty pretty boring in that sense. I, Gina I, Joe I, might have a totally different answer, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure. But I was I was thinking that uh, you know, with the amount with his history, would you consider writing a second book? I mean, that would be amazing. Or would you go to a different maybe announcer or a different personality? Stay tuned. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned, uh, my friend. Stay tuned. That's all I can. That's all I can say. Um, all right. Don't make me start yeah, pulling teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta get the ink to dry first on the uh, on the paper. So fair enough. there's your hint, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, this means that we're gonna have to get you back when you actually, you know, can talk about this stuff. I would be very happy to, and I am trying so hard not to drop a hint right now. So fair I'm enough. just going to. I will ask the next question. I will save you the the, the pain of holding your tongue. Thank you. <laughs> Source Point Press, obviously, you've mentioned them multiple times here. You've signed on with them to assist with, well, publishing your books. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the move to Source Point Press and what avenues does it open up for you? 
I've known Travis and Josh and Jacob and a lot of those guys in, in various capacities for years. And uh, when SourcePoint Press was pre-SourcePoint Press, you know, I told Travis specifically as well as <clears throat> as well as Josh, um, I said, I would love to work with you guys and I'd love to do projects with you, but I need national distribution because I think originally I was with Image Comics and then I bounced over to Devil's Due and uh, both of those platforms gave me national distribution of my books. And that was very clear because I liked those guys. I loved their hustle. I loved their ethic. Uh, I, 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 I loved what they were doing. But I told them, I said, I at least need to make sure that my work is coming out laterally. You know, I need national distribution. I said, when you guys get to that point, um, I'd love to work with you. You know, but it just didn't make sense to step back, you know, to, you know, being with Image and being with Devil's Due for what I was trying to do in my career in that point to, to, to take a bigger project, which wouldn't have that level of distribution, despite the fact that I'm on the road all the time, I hand sell books. You know, that's just what I needed. Well, um, SourcePoint Press starts to take off. And in the meantime, Gary Reed from Caliber Comics, who published Right or Wrong, hooked me up with uh, Twisted. And they wanted to do a comic. So we agreed to do a one-shot comic together to see how it would work. Gary was like, I got just the guy. He goes, he, he's into, he's really into rock and roll music and stuff like that. He's into horror. You know, this is your guy. You know, Detroit area. So we signed the contract to do um, a one-shot for Twisted Haunted High Ons. Um, <clears throat> and then Gary passed away unexpectedly very suddenly, very unexpectedly. Like we all saw him a couple weeks before the show and it was right before that year's New York Comic Con. That threw things into a certain amount of disarray. Obviously Gary was a friend, a mentor. And uh, so what ended up happening was we weren't sure what was happening with Caliber, who was gonna be the intended publisher of this one shot. So I basically went to Twisted's office and said, look, you know, I mean, Gary, you know, passed away. Um, I was one devil's do at the time. And I said, I know a publisher who would do a really good job with this book. And that's not to say that devil's do wouldn't have, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, they're, they got the trailer park boys right now and he's worked with other big franchises before, but source point being a Michigan based publisher and me wanting to work with them anyway, yeah. and me kind of wrapping up my time with devil's do, um, I, I knew that SourcePoint would be a really good fit. And, and, and Gary was a mentor to Travis McIntyre and Josh Werner as well, very much so. So I go, so they, they were interested in having a discussion with me. So then of course I run over to SourcePoint to Travis and I say, look, man, this could be a really big deal. I got a really cool art team on this book, Twisted's a nationally recognized brand. I mean, a lot of people I know look at them looked at them as like ICPs, protégés, and obviously they're part of the juggalo culture and things like that. Which, But that's a national thing. I said, this is a, this could be a big deal. I said, but we need to get national distribution on this. So it just so happens around that time, uh, Travis was talking to Diamond and finally, the second time around, got approved to be in a diamond. They were setting up these great displays, conventions and stuff like that. And diamond came by and saw what they're doing. Like, why aren't you with us? I'm like, why don't you mention that? You turned us down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, they got in. So the original Twisted One Shot was not only my first book with SourcePoint, but it was also one of the first of the three titles ever released in previews through SourcePoint Press. And I believe it was the first single issue because I think the other the other two are Salvagers and Dead Duck and Zombie Girl by Bob Sally and Jay Fosgett respectively. But I think we were the first one shot. And we then went on to debut the book as well at New York Comic Con. But that was my first book with Source Point. We haven't looked back. 2019 I had the free comic book day book, the Halloween Comic Fest book with Hope and Cthulhu Jr. respectively. We continue to haunt at high ons with them. Um Buried But Not my book, Buried But Not Dead, you know, a collection of all my lost tales from back in the day. Uh, is now in previews. You can get it through comic shops. It's a fantastic relationship. I know those guys. They're grinders. They're continuing to go. We've signed a deal with Simon and Schuster, um, awesome. and just continuing to make a lot of noise. And in the last year, especially, I, I think the pandemic really showed too what what we're made of as a publisher, 
you know, Source Point was very actively involved in sending free product to comic book stores directly when when Diamond was shut down to give them stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking at the Diamond Retailer Summit on behalf of Source Point was really cool and just they're great people. Uh, personally, and professionally, I have a lot of love for them and what they do. Our values align on a lot of the way we operate. We're grinders. We just push. We just go. And uh, I'm really excited about the next. Uh, year and a half two years of stuff i got coming out through them already that's awesome it, I've, I've seen them around i've talked with a few of their artists i've talked with jay foskett and a bunch of others as well too i'd love to have actually a month of just interviewing source point press like creators like i would just love to just have them on oh the show and just promote <laughs> yeah i mean you got guys like bob sally garrett gunn your Travis McIntyre is doing the Gloomhaven comic. One of our unsung heroes is Josh Werner, who's our art director. He's doing the Winchester House book. Nice. I mean, it just, there's a lot of smaller publishers that have these flash in the pan moments. And then you got someone like Source Point, who's just going and going and going and going. We don't, you know, I joke around, we don't hire publicists, we publish. You, you know, <laughs> and, and you got you got people out there who and I'm not trying to sound salty, but we'll get very big press release on what I would consider very low impact stuff. Mm-hmm. But people will see a New York Comic Con this year. We're finally stepping up. We're going to start showing people what we're really about. Uh, that's not my announcement to make, but maybe by the time this airs, it'll be out there. But we're we got some pretty big things lined up and people are going to really see what, what we're about as a publisher. We're we're stepping up. Looking at yourself as a writer, though, what early experience did you learn that language had power? Wow. I grew up in a very, very small town. And uh, I grew up as a very avid reader. And um, I think that's what it came down to for me, the power of the written word and how you can create worlds and create such visceral powerful imagery and communicate such big ideas that that's something that really struck with me you know and i don't care if you're reading jules verne or you're reading stephen king or you're reading children's books you know um it, it, it just blew me away. And, and there's a lot of science and stuff that can even tell you that there's certain people that are more predisposition to be able to be better readers. You know, my mom uh, read me every night when I was little, so that helped. And I've always been a very ad- advanced reader as a kid. But um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of us grew up in a small town and not being a kid that had a lot of friends growing up because <laughs> you know, there was no one around. <laughs> and it just being a reader, you know, and, and, and reading books, just as long as i can remember what's your latest literary pilgrimage that you've gone on uh i have been reading uh caitlin kiernan uh or kiernan's uh houses under the sea which is an anthology of her all of her lovecraft mythos stories um i got a signed copy of the book um and I've been, it's, it's dark. There's times where I gotta like put it down for a minute. I'm like, wow, this is heavy even for me. But I'm reading that right now, um, anxiously awaiting the next Joe Hill. Um, and I'm also gonna be after that, cause you know, as a reader, you always have like your stuff stacked up. I'm gonna be diving really deep, I think in a lot of the Harlan Ellison stuff. You know, we lost Harlan a little while back and I'm a big fan of Harlan Ellison's work. And I think I wanna go through and just start reading everything. Um, Edgework Abbey, uh, Abbey Edgeworks is re-releasing all of his stuff in some really cool hardcover editions. Oh, wow. And I should have the first 10, I think it's 10 or so, of those coming my way pretty quickly here. I read a lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just looking at, at doing a deep dive back and just going through, all, reading, rereading and re-enjoying all the Harlan Ellison stuff, I think will be my next thing. You know, looking back at the authors that you've read in the past, which ones did you dislike at first, but they kind of grew on you later on? Hmm. Who didn't I like that grew on me? I'll be honest with you. I I can't think of anybody who 
I can't. I don't know if I could think of anybody who I disliked and, and turned or turned the corner on. I guess the only one I could think of a little bit is Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hmm. When I started reading the Scarlet Letter for the first time, I was like, my God, the guy is taking like <laughs> ten pages to describe a door. What's going on here? You know, he. But he grew on me as I read him. You know, and Nathaniel Hawthorne's. I mean, obviously, I was to say Nathaniel Hawthorne's fantastic. Hmm. Um, Shakespeare took me a minute. I love Shakespeare. I love reading Shakespeare. I mean, the master, you know, obviously. So those would be the the two. I, w- I would say Hawthorne and and and, and Big Willie S. William Shakespeare. For me, it was. Um, this is going to sound like sacrilege, but Tolkien for me initially, like mm. he was very dry and very hard to get into yeah. for me, and I was just like, okay. We're finally at the patch where they are about to leave Hobbiton and or the Shire, and it's like you still haven't left yet. I'm already a hundred pages in. Like, give me yeah, a, they, yeah, you're a hundred pages in, but they haven't even left. <laughs> it's like, you're killing me, Smalls. You're killing me. Yeah, no, no, that that's exactly it. You know, and sometimes you gotta you gotta be willing to invest a little bit. Yeah. And as younger people, that that's sometimes harder. But I also was a big short story guy too. And I always liked that get in, get out. Wow me. You know, Ellison, Bradbury, Poe, you know, the the, the holy trifecta, I think, of great short story writers. Very true. So yeah, then when you get into something like The Hobbit, it's like, <laughs> you know, or even something like Hawthorne who just, or, or Melville, you know, just taking their time getting there. It's like, I know you're, you look back and you appreciate it because they're building a world. You know, Herman Melville did that with Moby Dick. You know, I mean, you're learning as much about the whaling industry and what was going on as this, these weird characters, the sailor that may or may not be the devil, and, you know, and Ahab and all this stuff. So, do you believe in writer's block? Um, I know people have it. <laughs> you know, um, to me, yes stress and anxiety and things like that can make it hard to write well. My time, my problem is always just finding enough time to sit down and write as much as I want to. But I let the ideas bubble to the point where when I go sit down to write, they're bursting. And if I'm not getting traction on a certain story, I let it keep cooking. You know, I just let it keep cooking back there and I'll work on something else. Uh, Sometimes you got to do things like play some Tetris or over a walk or whatever or just let it cook you know and that's when you wake up the morning like i got it or you're in the shower like oh god you like wipe off and go like make a note you know like put like a notepad by the shower you know because when you're in there relaxing and you know the warm water and it's quiet you know and you get those ideas so i I believe it exists but um i think there's also ways like anything that you just have to work through tease it out and sometimes it's going to take time as well. Sometimes you just got to keep your system running in the back of your brain to kind of tease it out, piece it out. What is the wisest thing that someone has ever told you? Don't mumble. Don't ever mumble. Harlan Ellison told me that when I was talking to him. Why is that? Why do you think that, I should say? I'm a very shy person in real life when I'm talking about my work. Uh, very introverted. I, I can turn it on when I'm working. I'm working right now, turning it on. <laughs> you know, um, but, and, and I've had this discussion with other people I know as well. You know, there's people that are out there and say that, oh, you know, Dirk man, he's always talking about himself, talking about, you know, his work, blah, 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 you know, karaoke and all the, you know, wild man. You got to put yourself out there. You know, as of this recording, yesterday I just uh, did uh, two days as a faculty speaker for the uh, Midwest uh, Writers Conference. And someone was talking about agenting and publishing and how they didn't feel their publisher was doing enough to promote them. And I told them, I said, your publisher will never do enough to promote you. It doesn't matter how much they do, you're always going to want more. Or your agent or whoever you have. Yeah, you, you got to put yourself out there. That means you don't mumble. You know, you got to be proud of what you do. You got to own what you do, uh, and 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 just just push your work out there. You know, uh, if you don't, what that old saying, if you, if you don't toot your own horn, no one else will. 
that's not to be cocky. That's not to be arrogant. That's not to try to trick or manipulate people or into buying your work. That's not about trying to be everything to everyone. But rather, it's like, here's what I do. I write these really cool horror comics. Now I wrote this really cool wrestling comic uh, or comic about a wrestling personality. I wrote a book about to help people write comics. This is what I do. There's a reason I can still go out almost 20 years later and still have Nightmare World on my tape. Mm -hmm. It's a good book. I stand by it. And there's people, every convention I go to who buy Nightmare World have never seen it before. Because the idea of the horror anthology that weaves one big book with a cool art, they're into that. But you can't mumble about it. That's not to shout people down. You know, uh, nothing, I, I think nothing is more destructive than carnival barkers at Comic Cons you know, or foisting your book in people's hands. Now, it's not about screaming, but you don't mumble either. Be proud of your work, say what you do, find your tribe, and uh, yeah, don't mumble. What's one mistake that you'll never ever do again? <laughs> Just one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, top five. <laughs> oh yeah, God, how long do we got? Um, 16 minutes. <laughs> Gosh. Um, biggest mistake. I think it's very important to... That might be too personal of an answer. We're old friends. Why not? Yeah. Uh, I think maintaining your boundaries as you become a public figure is, is, is very important. And I've always been a very guarded very private person and for a long time i was very selective about who i let into my circle who i let eat at my table and over time uh i i loosened up i told myself that i was being too uh too private too paranoid it's okay to it's okay to let your your circle grow it's okay to bring people in and stuff like that you know these people care about you your friends stuff like that and um, Twisted, of all people, told me, I probably shouldn't put this on blast, but I guess I will. They warned me, they said, Dirk, they said, you're too, you're, you roll too deep. Your table's really big, man. And you're going to find out as things start to take off for you, who, who is sitting at your table just to eat and who's going to be willing to help you make the meals. I was like, no, man. I said, look, I got a big crew, but I got a good crew. I got good people in my life. And I do, and I still do. I still have some phenomenal people in my life. But I also, over time, you find out relationships change and evolve. And it's kind of the usual suspects. You look back and realize, like, wow, all the signs were there all along that maybe this this wasn't a, a healthy situation. So just, I, I think, maintaining those, those boundaries and is, is crucial. And, and that's something that I, I've learned a lot about and need to continue to be cognizant of. I love what I do. And I I truly, the in my soul, just want to help other people get to where they want to be. But um, there's a saying, uh, you have to have boundaries because the takers don't have any. And that's, uh, that's something that I learned. And that was, uh, I think I stumbled on that pretty hard and continue to monitor that now moving forward. You know, we're wrapping up here. I have my last four questions I ask every interview, but before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you want to showcase and share with those that are watching and listening to this? Yeah, uh, a couple quick things. Uh, my, Like I said earlier, my new book, Brave But Not Dead, is now in previews. Uh, by the time that you'll be seeing this, we will be getting close to Haunted High Ends Volume 2, Number 1, the new uh, Haunted High Ends miniseries, Curse of the Green Book. Will be coming out. It's going to be a forest mini series. Both of those do Source Point Press. Um, I think when this goes on air, I'll be at Astronomicon in Arbor all weekend. My full convention schedule is up at DirkManning.com. People can find out I'm going to be on the road. I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to be C2E2, Motor City. You know, Semi close to you, if you can get out, cross the border, uh, be all over the place. Um, I totally redesigned DirkMang.com. It's a really cool experience now to go see the site. My full bibliography is on there for the first time in my career. Like, like just crazy amounts of stuff is on there. Um, 
And uh, you mentioned mystery earlier, so I'm just going to mention that in October, uh, once Butts and Seats ships, uh, we'll be launching the Kickstarter for Tales of Mystery Volume 5. It's titled Rockstar Paranoia, illustrated by Austin McKinley with Ringo, Ringo Award nominated colorist Alessandro DeFornasari uh, through SourcePoint. And we're also going to be doing the Tales of Mystery Act 1 compendium, which will collect the first four volumes in one big compendium edition, including Volume 1 in full color for the first time. Yeah, 2020 put us uh, put everybody behind schedule. So now it's like I have this log jam of stuff between Butts and Seeds, Bear But Not Dead, Haunted and High Ons, Re5, other stuff. So yeah, that'll be cool, man. It'll be good. Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My grandfather. Hands down. Uh, my English teacher in high school was also very, very, very crucial to me. She did a lot to help me out, but definitely my grandfather. Um, hardworking, good guy, um, did a lot to support me personally and professionally. Yeah, hands down. Did he give you a book or get you into a certain book when you first started reading? No, he was not a reader. <laughs> But he was a businessman. He dropped out of high school at 16 and worked every day of his life ever since until until he fell very ill and passed. But just a hardworking guy, hardworking guy. He supported his friends. He supported, you know, the, the, the people that were important to him and his family and things like that. And just taught me a lot of life lessons. Um, right or Wrong 2 uh, will be coming out. I've been actively working on that. And people will get to know my grandfather through that book because of a lot of the life lessons he taught me about business. Writing and creating as a professional is a business. And uh, he was a sole proprietor. He was his own business. And while I work with SourcePoint Press and things like that, and I, I'm very happy to continue to work with him, um, he taught me a lot about being in business for yourself that allows you to get to this point like I am with SourcePoint. And um, I'm really excited that you know, my, my grandfather always told me, he goes, don't write about me until I'm dead, because then it won't matter. <laughs> he's, like, he did, he's like me, he's very private. He didn't want people to get to know him. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he taught me a lot about business. And, and I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of the lessons that this high school dropout learned about business and being very successful and how other writers and comic creators can use that to um, move forward in their own journey. From a professional perspective, you've written many books in your lifetime. You have now written uh, butts and seats you have now done so many others that are on your lower third currently right now and you're now part of source point press do you consider yourself personally successful 2020 was a year where i think all of us had a lot of time to do a lot of reflection on things um personally and professionally i took the, the a lot of the time off the road as well as working to do that and uh, you can kind of see behind me yeah, I, whoops, sorry, I'm back with nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, spinner rack of my own work. And I've always said my goal is to fill that spinner rack. And when I look back at it now, it's getting it's getting close. And I don't cheat, you know, it's like Tales of Mystery Volume 2 is four issues. I could fill four spots. I put the graphic novel in a spot. Mm -hmm. And my goal's always been to have a spinner rack, an old school spinner rack. You can see, you can kind of see that's an old one. You know, filled with my own work. I never stopped to take the time to realize how close I'm getting. And one of the things that 2020 taught me was it's okay to turn off a little bit sometimes and just appreciate, even for a minute, what you're doing. I'm working with Tony Schiavone. I'm working with Twisted. Uh, I finished Nightmare World. I put up the Nightmare World Bible and the Nightmare World Omnibus. It's still, Nightmare World still sells. I'm getting to do my project, which is my, my, my most personal project, Tales of Mystery, is going to be volume five coming out. You know, um, I'm making comics. I'm on the road. You know, I, I have good friends. I have a great publisher that works with me. Um, I'm loath to say that I'm successful, but I also have to have enough personal and professional integrity to say, my God, you know, look at my bibliography, DirkMang.com, and how long it is, you know, what's been going on. And I've been at Image, and I'm sort of, you know, just, I've set records on Kickstarter. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I, I would say I would say so. You know, I, I love to say that because that doesn't mean I'm content. But I've learned in the last year to keep perspective. 
And by any metric, I've had a very successful career so far, even though I think I'm continuing to level up as we go, even, even through stumbling, leveling up, you know? So, yeah. Yes. Yes, Kurt. I'm successful there. I said it. I hate saying it, but I said it. I said Thanks, old friend. I, I said personally successful. There's a different. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Well, it is what it is. But it, yeah, it's, it's all it's all part of it. It's all uh, everything's a work in progress. You've done good for yourself, you know, and you've continued to have a great career, and uh, that's why I keep asking you back. So I, you're I'm a good person you. overall. So thank you. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You step back. You uh, reflect on what you could have done differently which you should do differently moving forward and uh, try not to re repeat it. I mean, it's, it's that simple. We're all going to fail, whether it be personally, professionally, um, we're going to have missteps. Ultimately, they're stumbling blocks and they're learning experiences. The only true failing failure is giving up, you know, and, and, and there have been, <sighs> that's not true. I was going to say, there's been times where I wanted to give up my comic career. That's not true. I, I can't say that with a, with any amount of integrity. But there's times you definitely have to reprioritize, reevaluate what you're doing and just find ways around the obstacles that are in your way. And sometimes you are your own obstacle. And if that's the case, you know, you're making decisions or things like that that are not conducive to what you want in life or the type of person you want to be or the type of person, I would say the type of person you want to be seen as, but I mean, we live in a choose your own reality world now. I'm sure there's people out there that are convinced I'm sort of part of some baby eating Illuminati or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, think think what you it's like get away, like think what you want. You take the time to reflect and reevaluate and, and you gotta find your own center. And to find your own center too, again, it comes back to that boundaries thing. You have to have your boundaries. You have to make sure you give yourself the time and take the time to step back, evaluate who's in your circle, what choices are you making? Why are you making those choices personally and professionally? And then, um, and then evaluate and move forward accordingly, you know, fall down seven times, stand up eight. Good answer. Very metaphysical. Sorry, gosh, I'm getting all philosophical here. Sorry about that. That's the reason for the questions. <laughs> Fair enough. The younger generation is looking work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator or as a, uh, announcer for wrestling which i think would be really cool or creative in any other endeavor they decide to choose how can they inspire the generation that follows them don't be afraid to share what you've learned i think that's the biggest thing um I was, you know, in the comic industry and a lot of other industries as well, when people are successful and they find a little way through like the, through the walls they see in front of them, they patch them up behind them. They don't want anyone else to get through. A lot of people have this mentality that if you kill the king, it's easy to become the king. It's very weak-minded thinking. It's not true. Uh, I, I think we live in a, a society nowadays where you know, young, young people, especially, I think, sometimes are falling into this trap. I read this phenomenal scholarly article, journal article, about morally motivated network harassment. Hmm. And they cited the example of that dentist who shot the lion, and his picture went viral. I don't know if you ever saw that all over the internet. Mm -hmm. and people were outraged and screaming, and he shot a lion, this guy. And like, they like spray painted his house, they harassed him at his work, all, all this crazy stuff. The thing is, he knew anything illegal. He got a license, he went out, and he hunted and posted a picture of it, but somebody went online and what happened, they then positioned themselves in the moral on the moral high ground, which justified harassing behavior. And that, a lot of that stems from the idea, I think in creative circles of, if we tear people down, we're gonna clear the way for us. Don't do that. Don't, that's not the name of the game. That's very short term gains. That's very small minded thinking. You know, you know, what was it? You know, let he who's without sin cast the first stone. You know, I mean, you know, there, there are certain rules that permeate any society because they're, they're valuable. So what I would say is be positive. 
uh, pay forward what you know, help other people. Again, you have to respect your boundaries. You have to recognize when maybe someone is, you know, uh, is toxic or uh, a situation where it may not be in your your best interest personally or professionally, or maybe beyond your capability to do what you can to to help somebody out. But you got to be positive and pay it forward. And you know, there's people that talk about you know toxic positivity or something like that. You know, it's like you 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 know, like they broke their arm. You're like, well, at least you didn't break them both. It's like, okay, yeah, but, you know, can we have a little sympathy? Can we address the fact that my one arm is broken here, please? <laughs> you know, I need help bringing in the groceries or getting into my car or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, I don't know if I drive with one arm, but anyway, um, maybe I would. So uh, being positive, and I think, and paying it forward is crucial. Um, we live in weird times, man, you know, where, where, we're still in the infancy of social media. We're still in the infancy of everyone being able to have multiple websites. Um, and I think ultimately in time, we're gonna look back at this time period as that Wild West time and, and, and look at how the very, I would say at times dangerous impact that, that social media has on people's disposition and mindset. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it can get really, I mean, gosh, I don't have enough time to, I guess, say as much as I want to say about this, but I'll, ju I'll just say, be positive, you know, be positive, promote the positive. Anytime you take time to talk about something negative, you're taking away from the opportunity to talk about something positive. Now, I'm not saying we should ignore things that are negative. I'm not saying we should ignore things that we find grossly conflict with how we feel the world should be. However, we also have to own the fact that it is much, ultimately much better to use our, our platforms and to use our, our life to promote the positive, to help other people out. And when you see people that are stumbling or falling, don't dogpile them. Offer a hand up. I've struggled. Everyone in this world has struggled. Everyone's fighting battles you don't know. Help up. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what's going to make the world a better place. So be positive, pay it forward, share what you know to help build up people. And if you see people struggling, help them. Yeah. You know, Dirk, I hate to say that this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You know, you survived another interview. I think this is your fourth or fifth time on the show. So you're in, yeah. I think you're in the five timer club right now for two geeks talking. So that's all right, time. man. And, and hopefully we'll get to do this again sooner and later. And uh, we so. can uh, circle back around and talk about some of that new stuff coming up. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, support Dirk, support his work, support his books that are coming out that, you know, at his conventions, everything. Just support the guy. He's just a good guy. He's created some amazing works in the past. And I know he's going to create amazing works in the future, even though I can't, you know, you know, poke him for any information about that just yet. But I, I know that you'll be able to support him in the future for sure, too. Yes, sir. Where can we find you, of course, on social media and everything like that before I let you go? At all, uh, pretty much all social media platforms at Dirk Manning. Look for the guy at the top at the scarf. My website is DirkManning.com. A really cool experience there now. You can sign up for my monthly newsletter. Uh, I send out a newsletter on email once a month. Other shows I'm doing, books coming out, exclusive previews. In fact, I'm working on my newsletter for the next month right now. I'm going to share some exclusive stuff there. Uh, a really cool Facebook group, the Friends of Dirk Manning Sport Group, where we just talk about horror, heavy metal, comics, and ice cream. But yeah, uh, Instagram, Facebook. God help me, even Twitter, at Dirk Manning, Good stuff. or DirkManning.com. Hey, all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening and watching over the years, and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.